hey everybody, Z Garcia here, and welcome back to Board Game Blender. On this episode, which we are calling I Dreamed a Dream, we are going to be talking about games that put you in a dream setting, or feel like you are in a dream setting, because they are so bizarre, because their logic is so dreamlike, anything of that sort. I think it's uh, an interesting concept to think of this, Though there are not that many games that are specifically set inside of a dream. It's kind of an underutilized uh, theme, I would say. But it is that setting, or anything similar to it, is the ultimate escapism, right? And that's ultimately what board games are about. About escaping your own reality. About being, you know, a pirate. Or being a uh, medieval uh, character in some, in some castle. Or a viking, or what have you, right? And so dreams, by their very nature, are the absolute best example of that escaping your own trappings. I, I find it to be a fascinating idea. So we're going to be talking about that today. If you are someone who likes to get into gaming because you like being able to go to a world unheard of, because you like to escape for an hour or two into something that's largely undreamt of for you, then games with, uh, hopefully games on this list will be something that you will particularly enjoy. So, thanks for joining us. Again, I hope you find at least one new game that's new to you, and maybe you'll discover a new favorite. But without further ado, let's kick off the episode. Howdy, folks. Welcome to the Four Player Showdown. I'm Hunter. I'm Nessa. I'm Caitlin. I'm Rebecca. And today we are looking at... Stuff Fables. Stuff Fables. All right, Ness, what's the game about? The game is about there's a girl and she's having bad dreams. So you're stuffed animals and you're trying to save them as a team. So, Nessa, what character do you play in the game that we're playing? I just love bunnies, so I have flops. Flops. <laughs> and Caitlin, flops. which character are you? I am Theodora. What does that mean? I'm a teddy bear with a sword. <laughs> <laughs> I have arrows. And, and I'm an old dude with a pencil. You're a stitch. You're well. An you're kind of. It's kind of. It's a doll. But I'm old. It's a patch doll. Yes, oh. you're an old patch doll. You you happy now? And, and who's mom? And who's mommy? She's she's Lumpy the Hulk. Lumpy the Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff Fables is actually pretty easy to figure out once you get started with the game. The main drive of the game is dice rolling, and you've got different colored dice. They give you different opportunities in the game, so certain colored dice is for your movement, certain ones for defense, certain ones for attacking. Um, there's a wild die that you can decide to use, and the rule book's pretty helpful with you know, telling you what you need to do. Each scenario is a certain page in the book. You've got storyline right next to it on the other side of the page, and you just follow it down, follow the instructions, and once you get to a certain point in the game and figure things out, or don't figure them out, then you are able to move on. My favorite thing about Stuff Fables is the story. You get an awesome storybook, which is both your map and how to play each different scenario, and how you play those scenarios, whether you succeed or fail. Depends on how the story goes. We're about halfway through, and we're already enjoying the game quite a bit. So, Mommy, what's your favorite part of the game? My favorite part of the game? I like the characters and the fact that they all have their own special abilities that help each other out um, and pump themselves up, too. It's really fun. I agree with you. That is a lot of fun. Especially when Lumpy has the meat mallet. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to know what she's talking about... You have to play the game. Try out Stuff Fables. It's a really good game. We all agree on that. So, thank you so much for joining us. Hello friends of The Blend, and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Today we're talking about dreams, and when I think of dreams, I think about one board game. Atmosphere, published in 1995 by Mattel. This is a 3-6 to six VCR board game in which you're racing around the board trying to collect six keys. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I did say VCR. 
This is a VCR. Let me set this up and show you how it works. This is what the game board would look like set up. First, every player is going to write their greatest fear on this tiny piece of paper and then put it in this little cup here which they call the Well of Fears. You'll cap it up and put it in the center hub. Next, there's going to be six skulls here that are numbered one through six. You're going to draw one and that just determines player order. Unfortunately, I do not have the skulls, so sad face emoji. To begin the game, you will stick the VCR tape inside the VCR player and then push play. On every single one of your turns, you're going to roll the dice and you're going to move that amount of pips around this center hub at first with your skull. The goal for the first 10 minutes of the game is to try to reach one of these spaces right here which will turn your skull into a harbinger and then you replace the skull with your playing piece. You would just replace the skull back in the hub. Now as you're making your move along the track here, every time you land on a tombstone or a special space, you just ignore it until you become a harbinger. So once you become a harbinger, you will take the appropriate card and put it in your holder here and this lists all the powers you have when you collect certain keys. Now when you start moving around the board, every time you land on a tombstone by exact count, you would just take that tombstone and put it here on your holder. You now have that power that's listed on the card. Every time you land on a lightning bolt by exact count, you will duel another harbinger with the power cards. Every time you land on a compass by exact count, you can move to any other compass on the board. Every time you move to a black hole here by exact count, you have to stay there until the gatekeeper releases you. Oh yeah, about the gatekeeper. He's going to flash on the screen every now and again and make you do some pretty undesirable things that you may not like. What a real jerk. Well, back to the regular scheduled program. The object of the game is to get a tombstone of each color from each of the provinces and make your way back up to your numbered skull that you started out with. Once you have done that, you will take the Well of Fears, name your fear. Now, I put wrote on here that I was afraid of cheese. Pick out a piece of paper and read the paper. And if it is not your fear, you will win the game. So this one says taxes. It does not say cheese, so I will hit stop on the VCR. I have won the game. This is a real blast to play if you set the mood just right. You'll dim the lights really low, put the TV on really loud. But can you believe that they said that this was the future of board gaming? Well, if you have any comments, comment below, or you can tweet them at me at RetroBoardGamer. That's all the time I have for now. May your rolls be hot. In Respect Your Elders, I talk about a game concept or mechanic, and then I try to trace that mechanic back through previous games that have done the same thing. Maybe talk a little bit about where it came from, and just highlight some other games that might do a similar thing, just to make you aware that, yes, there are other options out there just to have a little bit of fun. So I'm going to be talking today about Sea of Clouds here. This is a very dream-like game in which you are supposed to be a pirate, but you are, of course, a sp sky pirate. You are on your vessels here that fly through the clouds from floating island to floating island, gathering goods along the way. The mechanism that this uses, the central mechanic, is called a Winston Draft. What's a Winston Draft? Well, it's a drafting game, and a Winston Draft means that you are going to have some of these cards, in this case, three cards right here, one, two, three, and you are going to put three of these face down uh, under those spots. You are then on your turn going to take a look at the first one. You'll look at that card. If you want it, you take it, you replace a new card in its spot, you are done. If you look at it and don't like the card, you place it back down, you add another card to that stack, and then you look at the next stack. If you want this one, great, you take it, you put a single card there, you're done. If not, this goes back, you add another card to that, and you look at the last one and you can take that stack. And so the next player, you know, if you skip the first stack, would take a look at two cards. If they still don't want both of those, yet again, 
you add a card to that stack. That's a Winston draft. It allows you to uh, bypass choices you're not very happy with, and then that choice becomes better for the upcoming players. That's the general idea. Now, a Winston draft is something that comes from that name specifically, Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering invented by Richard Garfield, and a Winston draft is attributed to him as something that he came up with. The idea was to be able to do a draft normally done among more people with a, you know, standard drafting idea where you have a few cards, you take one, you pass the rest. That doesn't work as well with just two players. So the idea was to do a drafting format that would work with two players. This idea of going back and forth, making a weaker card, in your opinion, part of a better set so that a single action got you more cards. And then you take those cards and build your deck and play Magic the Gathering. Well, that idea has been done in many other games. Uh, one recent example, a little older than this as well, is a game from Richard Garfield himself called Spynet. And in Spynet, you are gathering spies using a Winston draft and then uh, gathering cards that score based on uh, specific conditions you have. However, you need the spies in order to take the scoring cards. Another game that does this, uh, sort of a variant of this, which is, I think, one of the uh, best examples of taking a Winston draft and changing it up a little bit, is a game I like very much called Cleopatra and the Society of Architects. Now, in that game, you are going to, first of all, have some of the cards, about half the deck, be flipped upside down and then shuffled into the regular deck, so that about half the deck is cards that are face up, about half of cards that are face down. You then set some out, and on your turn, you are going to take a stack and then add a card to every stack there. Meaning the one you just took gets a single card. Everything else is now at least two cards because you pass that over. And so some groups become uh, something players keep avoiding. Either there's a card in there they don't want or don't care about, and it continues to build. Now, you're not going to know exactly what's in that stack because some of those cards will be face down. But some are face up. And if they're all face up, then you know exactly what you're getting. Maybe that's exactly the power you want. If there's two cards face up, one face down, are you willing to risk it on the face down card? Maybe it's something you want to avoid. It's a really great concept and it basically works like a Winston draft, though it's a little bit faster and with a couple of twists in it. So there you go. You now know what a Winston draft is. If you did not, Sea of Clouds is a very fun, very bright, straightforward example of using that mechanism in not just Magic the Gathering, but a card game as well. So uh, that is my pick for Respect Your Elders. Sea of Clouds, very strange, dreamlike idea, but a really fun, punchy, quick game. Take a look at it, and thanks for checking this out with me. Hey, what's up guys? I'm Rafa. And I'm Callie. And welcome to Table for Two. Today we got for you the Ravens, the Ravens of Thrott Shahashri. Yeah, I'm probably saying that wrong, but either way, this is a two-player only co-op card game. And the premise of the game is that one player, Ren, is in a dreamlike state forgetting her memories and her psychic friend, Feth, is then diving into her dreams, saving her memories from the evil ravens. And so during Feth's turn, he's going to be drawing from Ren's memories and trying to build a puzzle in the common area where only uh, pictures can overlap or faded memories can overlap. And so Feth is going to be building out a puzzle in, that Ren is going to be taking from the memories that Feth created and completing a poem. She's got to add numerical values uh, 7, 7, 7, 5 in order to complete her poem. And after that, you do it three times and each dream gets harder and harder because the ravens start stealing the memories. So what did you think about the game, Callie? I love it. And what do you like about it? Well, I like that there's no communicating, so it's kind right. of like you have to look at the person's actions to um, determine what they're thinking, and especially when you're playing Feth, 
you don't know what cards Ren has, so you're trying to give her plenty of options, but also use the cues that the player's giving you mm -hmm. to decide what you're going to put out on the Altman and whatnot. Right, I forgot to mention, so the key, com the key rule in this game is that you can't communicate. So you're in the dream, you're working together, and Feb gives Ren the options, and then Ren goes, no, I don't need that. Yes, I want that. So that's why I like being Ren because I get to, I'm good at communicating without, with the actions mm -hmm. and I like you being Feth because you're great at puzzles. Yeah, so when I'm Feth and placing the cards in the puzzle, I try to make sure that like, okay, if I place this card here, it, op it, it gives you these possibilities based on the colors and the numbers mm -hmm. and it's really fun. Right, and uh, the thing I most enjoy about it is it, the game gives you some narrative. You have a story, and as you beat the game, you then op open one of three envelopes. So, one, two, and then three. And we've only opened the first one so far, but it gives you a little bit more of the story, and it really ramps up the game, making it harder. So, I hope you guys check it out, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. board games where we talk about topics, trends, and things in board gaming and how we feel about them. So the topic for the blunder this week is I Dreamed a Dream, which is from Les Mis, I think? I probably. Dreamed a Dream. Anyway, it's about um, games that are about dreaming or make you feel like you're in a dream or have a dream-like quality. Mm. And so, yeah. Yeah, we instantly thought of this game, well, I Project... Don't know. Oh. I don't know if we instantly thought of it. We thought of a couple of games, yeah. some of which other people are talking about on the Blender. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mysterium mm -hmm. is kind of dreamlike. It but is. yeah, but then after. I guess then in that, it would be uh, that other one too. Dixit's dreamlike. Oh, Dixit's very yeah. dreamlike. Yeah. Um, but we did eventually think of this little game, which is called Project Dreamscape by, let me get this right, uh, Sarah and Will Reed. And you'll notice, maybe you'll notice. That, um, and these are just like cheapo red sleeves, that this is actually a print and play game. Now this is the second Kickstarter I ever backed in my board gaming... A print and play Kickstarter? Yeah, you see those sometimes. Oh. Actually they're becoming, I would say, more common where like a lower tier, like we could have gotten Consentical. Oh yeah, oh, that makes me feel that. like it's in a dream. Okay, oh. So like Consentical we could have gotten as a print and play, mm. but I backed at the higher level and we got this because nice box. Because the art is so cool and that makes you feel, yeah, like I said before, like you're in a dream, a to really, me at least, a really a weird... A really weird dream and we're yeah, just going to leave it at like that. Like a kind of dream my friend Carly would have. <laughs> uh, it's a great game, it uh, definitely has it has a weird theme, so look into it before you go out and buy it. Um, but we've been enjoying it. Yeah. This, on the other hand, has a pretty harmless theme. You're just trying to have the best dream by getting uninterrupted symbols. It's actually it. a pretty cool little game, and I, I quite like it. And what it made me realize that I want to talk about in the Blender this week is print and play games as a, a trend, topic, thing in board gaming. One um, of them. It's definitely a thing. Like, there's a whole print and play community of folks. There are games that we've downloaded as a print and play, like, um, oh, that Hitler game. And we still. Hitler game? Yeah, the. Oh, Secret Hitler. Yeah, and we right. still bought it when it came out. So I don't think that it necessarily deters us from buying the game. It's just no. kind of like a nice taster. Yeah, well, it's so like the cool a sample. So the cool thing about Secret Hitler is they. Not only did they make that available as a print and play, uh, just freely, but they also encourage people who maybe were not comfortable with the theme to make Secret Voldemort, yeah. um, which is a print and play version. Which is and more been, offensive to me. Uh, <laughs> there's been some discussion about, I don't know, like whether you ought to go buy Secret Hitler if you're going to play the print and play. Yes. Um, I think it's cool that, like for instance, we own Escape from Aliens and Outer Space as a print and play because uh, that's what it used to be. 
My Little Scythe right here. Back when it was My Little Pony theme. Yeah. I mean, this, yeah, My Little Scythe began its life as a print and play that a guy put on BGG just uh, because he wanted to make it for his daughter and it's, then he made it available and now it's a real game that exists. It's nice to have kind of the barrier to entry lowered for board game designers that this is mm -hmm. a way that they can get their idea out there and not have invested a ton of capital and just see if it even flies, if people even like it. So if you see, or I guess what I would say is look into print and play games. I mean overall I am a fan. Yeah, yeah. so I check it out. I yeah. mean there's a bunch. Turn them off. Play them. Yeah. For today's quirky game, I'm taking a look at Mission Impractical, which is not a dream setting per se, but uh, the stories that come out of this game very much feel like fever dreams. They are going to lead to some crazy, just bizarre stories that you are creating in the game. Here's basically how it goes. You are going to have a board like this in front of you. You are going to flip four scenarios underneath. These are things that uh, you are attempting to achieve. So for example, Win a Nobel Prize, keep someone from snoring, sail around the world, uh, extinguish a fire, catch a crocodile, things like that. And then you've got these cards that you are going to create a 4x4 four, four four grid with, and they have items on there like socks, like a rattlesnake, a radio, a snowball, rollerblades, a rubber band, things like that. You are going to then, if you are the leader for the round, You'll shuffle up your cards here, numbered one through four. You'll pick one at random, or someone will pick it for you. You'll take a look at that number. And that's the uh, thing you are trying to accomplish. So let's say it was, uh, keep someone from snoring, okay? No one else knows this. And then I am going to start picking a card from each column of these. So I have a choice of four cards in four separate columns. So I'll go ahead and take a token and put it on the card that I am picking. Then I pick a card from the next column, one from the third, and finally one from the fourth. These are things that are going to, that I'm going to use in my made up story here, my fever dream to achieve, uh, you know, keeping someone from snoring. Everyone around the table is going to guess, using their own set of numbered cards, what they think I am trying to do. They'll even tell a little story as to how I'm accomplishing it, according to what they think I'm doing. Then I'll reveal the real one and tell my own version of the story. You uh, have a, an optional rule where someone can even say, okay, stop before you're done selecting and make their guess immediately for a higher risk, higher reward without seeing all of my choices yet. And that's basically it. So it's it's the stories that come out of the game that make it feel like this sort of crazy scenario. So keep someone from snoring. I might pick a shopping cart. I might pick this is this wouldn't work like this. I'd have some choices. Sandpaper, and then I might pick uh, itching powder, and I might pick uh, laughing gas. And then I tell my story. So what I'm going to try to do here, the way I keep someone from snoring is, I uh, go ahead and grab sandpaper, and on the back of it, I spread some glue, and I put some itching powder on that. Then I, I hook that up to a shopping cart tied to the nozzle of a tank of laughing gas, and I suspend this um, uh, sandpaper over this person right over their face. If they start to snore, they'll blow on the paper you see and it's going to flip that paper over, releasing some of that itching powder. That's step one, that should do the trick. If that doesn't do it, however, they're going to keep blowing on that paper, which is going to spin, opening up the laughing gas. And uh, once that happens, they are going to hopefully start laughing instead of snoring, which will be great, I'll take it. If that doesn't work, you open up enough of that laughing gas, it's going to get the shopping cart going, which is simply going to run into the bed, and that should wake them up. And that's it. That's how I'm going to keep someone from snoring. Yeah, it's going to take a little reset time every night, but it'll probably be worth it. And again, that's the game. It's sort of a silly idea. It's sort of this, you know, you start giggling about these bizarre scenarios. If this is something that you think sounds good to you, that's what you're getting in the game. It's sort of a Mad Libs type activity. Uh, with everybody bringing some ridiculous creative, uh, you know, concepts to the table. So that is Mission Impractical, a very silly, very straightforward party game 
that I think definitely fits because it, it just feels like bizarre dreams that you are having. This is the kind of thing that when you wake up, if you remember your dreams, that is, you'd probably find someone that you can tell. A, you, you're not going to believe this bizarro dream I had for a contraption to keep someone from snoring. So there you go. Thanks for checking this out. Quirky, bizarre game. Definitely give it a look if you're looking for a party game. That's not the usual style of party games to be found out there. Mission impractical. So today, Nora, we are going to play the Wizard of Oz game of the Unlock series. In the Unlock series, it is going to be like an escape room. <gasps> have you ever done an escape room, Nora? Yes. <gasps> Did you lock the doors? Do I have to play board games till, till I get out of this place? But there are so many board games, Nora. Look at it. We will have so much fun. In the Unlock series, you're going to get a deck of cards and you're going to get the app. And the app is going to play awesome music that belongs to the scenario and it is going to maybe give you hints when you need it or you can lock in some codes that you are trying to discover during the game and are trying to unlock. You're going to have 60 minutes and the faster you're going to do it, the better and the less hints you use, of course, the better you do as well. Don't worry guys, I'm just First, to explain the game, I'm going to show her a little mini scenario that looks like this. So, you have cards like these that show you a room and they are going to show you cards that you're going to use in this scenario. So, maybe you are going to be in the office and it shows you some numbers and those numbers you are going to take out of the pack of cards, out of the deck of cards. That are the numbers that you are going to use. Then with those cards, you're going to try to solve puzzles. You have cards like these ones that have a red border and you have cards like this one that have a blue border and those cards you have to try to match with each other. But, and they have those numbers and those numbers, when you match them, you're going to try to find this corresponding card. Mm. And then you will see if you solved it correctly or if you were stupid and just were adding random numbers. <laughs> But you are not stupid, so you are going to try to solve the puzzle real. You're also going to have cards with this yellow, yellow border where you're going to try to find a four digit code that you're going to put down in the app. You're going to have machines that have these green borders you're going to, with, with which you're going to have a little mini game in the app that you're going to try to solve with the information that you find on the cards. Like Mario. Like Mario Party, exactly. And uh, those are most of the cards that you're going to use. During the game you're going to of course get unlock haha, new cards by combining cards and by opening new doors and finding new places. On some of the cards, Nora, there are also going to be little mini clues that you have to search for by really looking carefully at the card and searching for all those numbers. So hopefully you don't get too paranoid. For the Wizard of Oz scenario we are going to get this map of the Land of Oz and we're going to get this deck of cards, Nora. Do you think you're ready? Are you ready for this adventure? I'm ready! Wizard of Oz, here we come! Press the button. Oh. <laughs> that was so hard! We barely made it! But in the end, we persevered and we won! Yeah! Nora, what do you think of the game? It was so exciting! <laughs> but now, I want all my dreams to come true! Just like the Tin Woodman, the Cowardly Lion, and the Scarecrow. And, yeah, how can I make sure all of my wishes are fulfilled? I don't know. And now, you have to be the good witch, Glinda. I don't want to be the good witch! Anna. Okay, I will be the good witch. Good witch, how will all of my dreams come true? I, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. But maybe these shoes oh. will work. Oh, thank you. And uh, what should what should I do? 
I don't know. You I didn't know. tell me to. Oh! Click the shoes together three times and then all your wishes will come true! Oh, thank you, good witch! I will try it immediately! Oh my god, where am I? This is not Broadway. This is. Anna, where did you bring me? Take me home. I'm never gonna be an actor here. I think I'm in Africa or something. Anna, help me. Nora, where are you? Hi, I'm Wendy and this is the Teacher's Lounge. If you're like me, then sometimes you have really mysterious dreams. Also, if you're like me, you tend to teach games to your friends and family. Here in the Teacher's Lounge, we give teaching tips, and today we are covering Mysterium. So Mysterium is a co-op game about a ghost who's trying to get these psychics to figure out who the murderer is. And the ghost does that by taking these interesting dream cards. Now, all that they are is very unique um, illustrations and artistry, and they're trying to use them to help each one of these players discover the the who, what, and where ooh, ooh, of their but, murderer. But, yeah, but don't forget that once a person guesses, you can also use these um, tokens to try and, and guess. Oh, hold on. Wait, so I mean, we're, so like, well, I'm just trying to cover this part. Sure, right but here. the timer is so important, and also well, the ghost has these tokens. I mean, really, we and, don't use and the, the timer that. And don't forget I mean, about the, 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 the clock. Yes. So what I did right there was excellent co-teaching, right? Nope. I think you get a thumbs down for that one. Oh, uh, not two thumbs down. <laughs> Two thumbs down. Ah! Okay, so really, I don't think you've had anybody that has been that bad at co-teaching with you. But usually, there should be one teacher at the table. Mm -hmm. One teacher, and maybe they're not teaching and explaining the way that you are used to it or you want sure. to. And maybe you're tempted to say, like, oh, let me clarify this or whatever. But it's usually best to just let that person finish teaching. I agree. I totally agree. And I think that it's really hard as someone who isn't... So in our family, Chris is the main teacher, and I'm excited about the game, and I want to share it with my friends too. And so I find other ways to help out with the teaching process that is not interrupting and teaching things on the side. So for example, I may take seven cards out of this because you need seven cards for the ghost. And I'll just lay them out nicely in front of Chris. Like, here, have these. Maybe I'm explaining, hey, the ghost uses these mysterious cards, these dream cards, to help them, you know, point mm -hmm. the investigators in the right direction, and Wendy will lay cards out in front of me, and I'm like, hey, cool, where'd these cards come from? Thanks. It's mysterious. Like she's a ghost. <laughs> no, and I think that it's just, it's so, there's other ways that you can help, and you can facilitate, or you can answer questions when people have them, but to take over teaching, or to start, like, mm -hmm. jumping in, it's it's a little rude, and so I, I do my best. I restrain um, and I just let other people have the joy of teaching as well. So I think that co-op games are fun, but co-op teaching is maybe not the best choice. There you go. Well, thanks so much for watching the Teacher's Lounge today. Thanks to my wife, Wendy, for joining us. And you can listen to and follow our podcast, Meeple Overboard. Mm -hmm. uh, go and check that out. Enjoy the rest of your board game blender. <laughs>